The student as nigger. Jerry Farber. Video three. Carrying on. Bleeding brains. How does sex show up in school? First of all, there's a sadomasochistic relationship between the teachers and the students, and that's plenty sexual, although the price of enjoying it is to be unaware of what's happening. In walks student in his Ivy League equivalent of a motorcycle jacket. In walks the teacher, kind of intellectual rough trade. And flogs the students with grades, tests, sarcasm, and snotty superiority until their very brains are bleeding. In Swinburne's England, the whipped schoolboy frequently grew up to be a flagellant to be a flagellant. With us, the perversion is intellectual, but it's no less perverse. Sex also shows up in the classroom as academic subject matter, sanitized and abstracted, thoroughly divorced from feeling. You get sex education now in both high school and college classes. Everyone determined not to be embarrassed, to be very up-to-date, very contempo. These are the classes for which sex... As Pfeiffer puts it, can be a beautiful thing if properly administered. And then, of course, there's still another depressing manifesto of sex in the classroom. The off-color teacher who keeps his class awake with sniggering sexual illusions, obscene titters, and academic innuendo. The sexuality he purveys, it must be admitted, is, it, is at least better than none at all. What's missing from kindergarten to graduate school is honest recognition of what's actually happening. Turned on awareness of hairy goodies underneath the petty pants. The chinos and the flannel. It's not that sex needs to be pushed in school. Sex is pushed enough. But we should let it be where it is and like it is. I don't insist that ladies in junior high school lovingly caress their students' cocks. Someday, maybe. However, it is reasonable to ask that the ladies don't, by example and stricture, teach their students to pretend that those cocks aren't there. As things stand now, students are physically castrated or spayed, and for the very same reason that black men are castrated in Georgia, because they're a threat. Once a nigger. So you can add sexual repression to the list of causes along with vanity, fear, and will to power that turn the teacher into Mr. Charlie. Sexual repression, vanity, their own ego, fear, scared of the students, and their will to power, the fact that they want to dominate over others. You might also want to keep in mind that he was a nigger once himself and has never really gotten over it. So these professors used to be students and they never got over it. And there are more causes, some of which are better described in sociological than in uh, psychological terms. Work them out. It's not hard. But in the meantime, what we've got on our hands is a whole lot of niggers. And what makes this particularly grim is that the student has less chance than the black man of getting out of his bag because the student doesn't even know he's in it. That, more or less, is what's happening in higher education. The results are staggering. For one thing, damn little education takes place in the schools. I mean, how could it? You can't educate slaves. You can only train slaves. Or to use an even uglier and more timely word, you can only program them. Dance or dunce? I like to folk dance. Like other novices, I've gone to the intersection or to the museum and laid out a good money in order to learn how to dance. No grades, no prerequisites, no separate dining rooms. They just turn you on to dancing. That's education. Now look at what happens in college. A friend of mine, Mitt, recently finished a folk dance class. For his final, he had to learn things like this. The Irish are known for their wit and imagination, qualities reflected in their dances, which include the jig, the reel, and the hornpipe. And then the teacher graded him A, B, C, D, or F while he danced in front of her. That's not good education. That's not even training. That's an abomination on the face of the earth. It's especially ironic because Milt took that dance class trying to get out of the academic rut. He took crass for the same reason. Great, right? Get your hands in some clay, right? Make something. Then the teacher announced that a 20-page term paper would be required with footnotes. Same thing I felt with Jerry Tolson's class. Jerry Tolson, black music. How can you... He almost ruined black music for me. And how do you ruin, ruin black music for me? How do you do it? You stack up a bunch of black music books and say all of them must be read and then pull out a bunch of boring-ass facts that we could have just read off of Wikipedia and then you give us a song list of your favorite songs that we have to learn. It's a lot of fucking bullshit. It's a lot of... Too much fucking bullshit. Your tests are fucking hard. Too fucking hard. It took... It, you sucked out the enjoyment that I had. I had a natural curiosity for black music. I still do. But you almost killed it, Jerry Tolson. You almost destroyed it. Good thing every all music is black music. Jazz, bebop, hip-hop, rock and roll. 
they pretty much did it all, didn't they? <laughs> Without black people, we wouldn't have music. So it's also, I guess, inversely, that's why they got music in their ears, right? It's why they got the flavor and the swag and why they express themselves and they're always on. Uh, as a generalization, so. Uh, dance or du dunce? I like the folk dance. Like other novices, I've gone to the intersection or to the museum and laid out good money in order to learn how to dance. No grades, no requisites. Already asked this. So, then he asked the 20, turn 20 page paper in. At my school, we even grade people on how they read poetry. It's like grading people on how they fuck. But we do it. In fact, God help me, I do it. I'm the Adolf Eichmann of English 323. Simon Legree on the poetry plantation. Tote that lamb. Lift that spondy. Even to discuss a good poem in that environment is potentially dangerous because the very classroom is contaminated. As hard as I may try to turn students on the poetry, I know that the desk, the test, the IBM cards, their own attitude towards school, and my own residue of UCLA method are, tor have, are turning them off. Another result of student slavery is equally ser serious. Students don't get emancipated when they graduate. As a matter of fact, we don't let them graduate until they've demonstrated their willingness over 16 years to remain slaves and for important jobs like teaching. We make them go through more years just to make sure. What I'm getting at is that we're at least more or less niggers and slaves. We're at, le at more or less niggers and slaves, teachers and students alike. That is a fact you want to start with in trying to understand the wide social phenomena, say politics in our country and in other countries. Intimidate or kill. Educational oppression is trickier to fight than racial oppression. If you're a black rebel, they can't exile you. They either have to intimidate you or kill you. But in high school or college, they can just bounce you out of the fold, and they do. Rebel students and renegade faculty members get smothered or shot down with devastating accuracy. In high school, it's usually the student who gets it. In college, it's more often the teacher. Others get tired of fighting and voluntarily leave the system. This may be a mistake, though. Dropping out of college for a rebel is a little like going north for a Negro. You can't really get away from it, so you might as well stay and raise hell. And how do you raise hell? That's a whole other article, but just for a start, why not stay with that analogy? What have black people done? They have, first of all, faced the fact of their slavery. They stopped kidding themselves about an eventual reward in that great watermelon patch in the sky. They've organized. They've decided to get freedom now, and they've started taking it. Students like black people have immense unused power. They could, theoretically, insist on participating in their own education. They could make academic freedom bilateral. They could teach their teachers to thrive on love and admiration rather than fear and respect and to lay down their weapons. Students could discover community and they could earn to dance by dancing on the IBM cards. They could make coloring books out of the catalogs and they could out the grading system in a museum. They could raise one set of walls and let life come blowing into the classroom. They could raise another set of walls and let education flow out and flood the streets. They could th turn the classroom into where it's at, a field of action, as Peter Marin describes it. And believe it or not, they could study eagerly and learn prodigi prodigiously for the best of all possible reasons, their own reasons. They could, theoretically, they've got the power, but only in a very few places, like Berkeley, have they even begun to think about using it. For students, as for black people, the hardest battle isn't with Mr. Charlie. It's with what Mr. Charlie has done to your mind. The Student as Nigger by Jerry Farber, which is exactly right. They, they teach in obedience. It's, uh, the professors are the oppressors. They hate it when we talk. They hate it. They just, we're supposed to sit down and regurgitate any of the bullshit that they spit out. We're not allowed to have friends. We're not allowed to network. I'm learning information I could have learned off of Wikipedia. I'm not getting an education. Fifty fucking thousand dollars? That's bullshit. And while we're talking about education, I had Gerald Neal in my class, and Gerald Neal, I don't know. I mean, I got this weird, I got this weird mixture thing, but basically I feel like I'm the oppressed. You admire the oppressor because you're the oppressed. They can do all this stupid shit to you, so, you know, unless you can uh, say, fuck it, I don't give a fuck, and I'm going to stand up. And if it means losing my job or losing my position at the university, then I'm going to do it because it's uh, for my own dignity, for my own self-worth. And I did a couple things, but mostly I, I would just growl or just shake my head or complain a lot on off to the side or on the internet. Um, yeah, but Gerald Neal, he's our state representative, right? First African-American uh, state senator. He got arrested during the 1960s in order to get the Pan-African Studies program at the U of L. So 
Gerald Neal has, you know, he's been through the shit. He's got an impressive resume. He's probably got some bills and some legislation and shit passed, too. But I've seen Gerald Neal on a personal level, okay? I've seen Gerald Neal. Now, I'm not for sure right now if Norris Shelton is better, okay? Um, I'm weighing him out. I'm still weighing him out. Uh, um, just because I think there should be new blood in there. Uh, but, I, you know, I like, I like, well, I don't know. I don't want to say who I endorse right right off because I may not endorse either one of them. I mean, it's frustrating that he's been in the state legislature for the last 20 years, but look at Kentucky, and Kentucky has had a bad record for reaching out to its people. It has not been reaching out to its people, so it's just more of the same bullshit, more of the same show. When we uh, had voted on outlines in class, the majority of the students did not want outlines, and he had took the vote. He took the vote, and he saw that the majority were going to go against his, his way, and he immediately called it off. At the time, I didn't have the sense to say, no, 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 you called it off. You know, this is it. This is it. Majority stood. This is bullshit. You can't, you can't undo what you just did. So it was really frustrating. He gets in there, and he talks like, you know, he's God. He just kind of goes on and on, has these long, drawn-on um, sentences. Uh, like, if as soon as you stop talking, that might, you know, somebody's hand might be raised, and then they'll ask a question, and then you'll get it drone on and on. So it wasn't a dialogue. It was totally a monologue. He was talking at us, not with us. It was not a dialogue. We, that's how you learn is through a dialogue. And by the students being a bunch of Uncle Tom obedient bitches, by the students sitting in their classes and not actually dialoguing with each other, not getting a real education, we're all pretending like this slave, master-slave system is working. The one slave and the rest are slaves. One slave driver and the rest are slaves. One dictator the rest are the dumb masses. It's so fucking clear to me. It's so fucking clear. It's so it's clear to Jerry Farber too, and it's clear to anybody that's actually taking a look at this uh, situation. Most of my inclination to being a U.S. history teacher, and I've cut out all my opinions with it, but my inclination for being a U.S. history teacher is to be able to inspire their curiosity, to give the education that I never had. Ninety-five percent of the teacher's job should be about curiosity. And after you've had my class, you'll want to be learning about U.S. history. You'll understand, you'll recognize things, and you'll want to learn more. You'll want to figure out about this world. You want to see what, you know, um, see if my connections are making sense. And if so, uh, what can be, you know, ascertained from that? And if they're not, what connections and patterns do you see happening in U.S. history? So, I got a lot to say about education. I got a lot to say about education. My schooling interfered with my education. The Mark Twain quote. That school interfered with my education. I feel like during the summer I had to come here and order a bunch of books and read a bunch so I actually had something to offer the public. Something to offer that was different than anybody else. I remember my U.S. history teacher, Miss Flynn, Miss Wilson, okay? And she was such an asshole. She was boring and she was stupid and she didn't even know her shit. Uh, several, several things about that. The one, cla one class she asked us, what's the First Amendment? And someone said, freedom of speech. I raised my hand. I said freedom of speech. Uh, and I looked at my friend, Megan Bergen, and, and, Bergen, and she had uh, basically verified, yeah, of course that's right, freedom of speech, that's the First Amendment. And uh, Mary Beth Flynn, Mary Beth Wilson says, um, no, that's not right. No, that's not it, <laughs> right? Right? So, so, so these uh, sage on the stage are a guide by the side, right? So a sage on the stage is a person on the front. So she was more like a sage on the stage. I am holy and worship, uh, worship me and bow down to everything that I do and say. When you bow down to what it is that I'm saying and doing, then you will be rewarded, you know, greatly. Well, she would just read out of the book, and she was dull, and she was boring. And I remember she actually was the one to give me my first fucking B, and she was an asshole about it, too. I remember we had one person in class that got up and read the book. And when they read the book, they wound up getting a higher grade than my own presentation that I had did, and it cut, the bell had cut me off, and I said, oh, the bell cut me off, so I guess I'll be able to finish it the next day, and she had dropped my, my grade down below that, but frankly, I think that she was judging me because I would sleep in her class, she's so fucking boring, I'd fall asleep, and she'd say, go to the principal's office, and I was like, hell fucking yeah, I'm getting the fuck out of here, and I'd go sit in the principal's office until my next class would, would go, in fact, Miss Tilly, that's the way Miss Tilly would kind of uh, handle, handle me, I would, uh, be sat outside of class, out in the hall. Uh, and when I was out in the hall, I could do my work, and I was actually really focused, and I, I appreciated that. I went back and talked to Miss Tilly, and she's, uh, I guess she was drunk. She was drunk the whole time. She said she didn't, she didn't remember me. So fuck you, Miss Tilly. Piece of shit, asshole.
Fuck you too, Miss fucking Flynn. I guess you fucking changed your name 50 fucking times. Miss Flynn, Miss Wilson, Miss... Whatever the fuck you are now. I don't know. But you didn't give a good education. You sucked at U.S. history. You suck as a teacher. You, you, I still think you suck as a human being. Fuck you. You want to fucking smash me into subver subservience? Not going to happen. Sorry. Viva la revolution, U of L. Louisville. Occupy.